All right. Hello and welcome to our 57th Radical Poetry Reading. I'm Malva Kajali, Special Projects Associate here at The Rail, and today I have the pleasure and privilege of welcoming the wonderful poet Wa Win, who has lovingly curated a fantastic lineup of poets and readers for us today, featuring Dao Strom, Diana Khoi Win, Suvan Kam Tamavangsa, and Vi Ki Nao. A few quick notes before we get started. We'd like to start by thanking the Dermot Company for supporting this month of the new social environment. You can learn more about them and the Rails curatorial projects at 66 Rockwell, through the links I'll drop in the chat in a moment. We've started out all of our events with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we're on Lenapahoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappingurk, NRC, Wimsey, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. Um, the second acknowledgement is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter, and I think it's worth taking a moment to remember that the heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity for all those who struggle for freedom in recognition that when it comes to our liberation, our histories never unfold in isolation. That thought coming from the lovely Angela Davis. In that spirit, I'll drop uh, in the chat a living document of resources and actions. I encourage you all to check out. It'll be there in a moment, uh, but now it's my honor to welcome our wonderful host, poet Wa Win, uh, has had the privilege to work and teach and be all over the United States and Canada. She's the author of numerous books, including Violet Energy Ingots, which received a 2017 Griffin Prize nomination, and her fifth book of poems, A Thousand Times You Lose Your Treasure, was named a finalist for National Book Award for Poetry and the Governor General's Literary Award. In 2019, she was nominated for a Newstad International Prize for Literature, and since 2017, she has served as Associated Faculty, Associate Faculty of the University of Guelph Creative Writing MFA. Born in the Mekong Delta, uh, Wen was raised and educated in the United States, has lived in Canada since 2011, and here she is to grace us uh, with her poetic wisdom. Take it away. Oh, hello. Thank you so much, Brooklyn Rail. Thank you, Malvika, for that introduction. Thank you for attending today's social, new social environment. We're number 416, and this is a radical poetry reading. I'm curator Hua Wen, and I'll be the host today of this program where I'll, I'll be sharing the stage with four invited writers, Dao Strom, Diana Khoi Wen, Suvankam Tamavangsa, Viki Now. Um, in considering the curation for today's event, I was brought to the image, stay with me, of an oval of light, one that is made of sound, rhythm, and meaning, and that illuminates worlds normally assigned to sidelines and silence. I draw this card, um, this image from a, from a tarot card that I drew this morning from a new deck to me. This is the outsider tarot deck. Um, and the card I, I selected is the two of cups conceived and illustrated by designer Bobby um, Abate as two figures embracing an, an egg shaped object um, and renamed two of bottles. I'll show you the card here. Um, you'll see that it's figured, um, that that oval shape is figured in an embrace by two outsider artists, Talila, Tulula Banks and Billie Holiday, who were said to be lovers. Um, in this card, I see participants in an incubation, an embrace of an elemental structure radiant oval as shared creative foundation that nourishes a new making presentation or elaboration of forms released and led with the heart. Considering this foundational loving voicing like shared music, food, stories, and poetry I'm reminded of something that fellow first decan Aquarius, Jack Spicer said, words must be led across time, not preserved against it. The egg loved and released. 
The card and today's occasion further prompted me to recall a dream I had when I was preparing to travel in 2018 on a lifelong desired journey to Vietnam, a country I had left as a young toddler and to which I had never before returned. In the dream, instead of um, Hanoi, I was flying south to the Delta where I was born. A childhood friend waited with me in the airport and there was a lottery and I guessed the correct number and that number was two, as in two of cups or as the outsider deck has it, the two of bottles. And so I scored a ticket near the nose of the plane, a prime seat from where for clearance, I had to show the flight crew a special splay of colored wax paper discs. To, the, to my amusement, I also discovered that I had packed a wooden spoon and a spatula in my bag. These objects are another two, uh, this time an ordinary important objects, cooking utensils, spoon and spatula participants in an alchemy of nourishment linked to the site of mothering and the ability to fly. For day, today's event and the gathering of writers I have invited here, I was thinking about shared ethos, one that considers the now as well as generations to come. The word ethos is one I borrow from my longtime collaborator, co-editor, and life partner, Dale Smith, with whom I established the small press journal and book imprint, Skanky Possum, in the late 90s, Austin, Texas. Ethos suggests an element in the development of social outlooks that draws attention to the communicative and community establishing function of the small press poetry world. The small press poetry imprints such as Subpress, Phonograph, Omnidon, Peddler Press, and Black Sun Lit presses that have published the writers gathered here, presses that operate and incubate with culturally fugitive and institutionally marginalized poetics. I like to think of today's gathering of poets as representing a set of literary and social practices that encourage forms of poetic conspiracy on the edges of established networks of writing to make room for possibility in the making of an unruly but open space. Most especially, I believe in the ability for poetry to rephrase and renew ways of seeing and shape the function of creative participation in social realities. I like to think that a space such as this one we are participating in collectively can establish, can act to solicit listening, dialogue and exchange across barriers to establish relationships and locate forms of solidarity. I share the belief that the root of language and poetry is immediacy emerging out of a shared desire for communal gatherings and togetherness. And it is an honor to host this confluence of poetic styles, ethical sensibilities and aesthetic values. As with the tarot card I drew, we share among us an intimacy of collaborating, emotional links, mutual respect, artistic bonds and as diasporic kindreds. Next to the two of cups or bottles, I drew another card. Uh, the other card I drew uh, when reflecting on this gathering is the six of swords or six of lights as represented in the outsider deck. This card is associated with Mercury in Aquarius, which is where the planet Mercury was in the sky when I was born in Bin Long. This six is familiar to me, one that I associate with travel, traversing, transgressing, and in an act of synchronicity to Southeast Asia. In a garden near Hoi An, at the end of that first and so far only visit to Vietnam, I was listening to crow pheasants uh, at, and the Cocoa River 
and thinking about transnational friendships, poetry, family of origin, kinship, and language. And it was then that the Six of Swords came to mind, a tarot card I drew in a significant reading given to me directly before I left by dear friend, uh, writer, and tarot reader, Damian Rogers. And it's a card that I associate with moving past difficulty, passage, overseas travel, right timing. It's this card in the Rider weight deck. You'll see the boat and the passengers. And at that very moment that I thought of this card uh, in the garden in Hoi An, I saw an embodied symbol of the traveler on the Six of Swords card, a person standing in a shallow bottom boat rowing down the Cocoa River. In the outsider deck, the deck that I used this morning to, to draw these two cards, um, this card is expressed as the Six of Eyes, and it looks like this. Um, and in this deck, it's associated with the outsider of the hacktivist, the hacktivist. And when I, when I studied this card and its meaning this morning, it brought to mind a different style of boat. I don't know what they're called in Vietnamese. In English, they're called coracles. They're large, round, and woven, basket-like. Uh, made from bamboo available materials and ingenuity. These um, basket-like boats were designed by communities of enterprising fisher people of what was then known as Indochina or Indochine to the West. And these creators in the face of oppression came up with this design for fishing boats, one that they could pass off as baskets, thus outwitting, occupying, French colonizers and the punishing taxes they had levied on all fishing boats. And so I see this hack, these boats, uh, the basket light boats, in line with the meaning of this hacktivist card, this six of eyes or swords, um, the symbol of an activated community with a shared goal of social justice using open source communications that can create disruptions, subvert, break boundaries, and challenge the status quo. I hope that today's programming may serve as a similar site of fugitivity, empowerment, and transformation, a site of listening, sharing, and learning that imbues us with more nuanced understandings for meaningful action in the world. I am so honored to welcome our readers, Dow Strom, Diana Coy Wynn, Savankam Tamavangsa and Vicky Now, who will be reading in this order, which is alphabetical by first name. Each reader will introduce the next, con concluding with me. I will close the circle to regather us and draw a tarot card in reflection to a question at the end. So you'll want to stay tuned until the finish. Um, I'm so delighted to introduce our first reader, Dow Strom. My first introduction to Dow uh, was through um, their time as editor for Diacritics, a literary journal for the diaspora, diasporic Vietnamese artist network known as Divan, whose mission is to celebrate and foster diasporic Vietnamese literary voices. Dow had solicited and published my poems there and introduced me to She Who Has No Masters, a collective which she co-founded. Uh, the She Who Has No Masters collective of, of women and non-binary writers of the Vietnamese and Southeast Asian diaspora engage in collaborative polyvocal and hybrid poetic works through writing and art engagement activities that reach across borders. Artist Dow Strom works with three voices written, sung, and visual to explore hybridity and the intersection of personal and collective histories. The author of five books and two song cycles, most recently the poetry collection Instrument, which is terrific, and its companion album Traveler's Ode, Phonograph Records, Antiquated Future Records. Strom was born in Vietnam and grew up in the Sierra Nevadas of California. Please welcome Dow Strom to the stage. 
Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Brooklyn Rail, first for hosting us. Thank you so much to Hua for inviting me to join this and for that amazing introduction and setting the, the tone. Um, uh, since I'm the first reader and I am in a space with other um, women Southeast Asian diasporic writers, um, and uh, we also collaborate as she who has no masters, I thought I would start my reading with um, actually a sento poem that I made um, from lines in this book. This is called Troubling Borders, and it's an anthology of Southeast Asian women of the diaspora, um, art and literature. It's published by Divan, Diasporic Vietnamese Artist Network that Hua just mentioned. Um, it's an excellent resource, it's beautiful. And um, I wrote a poem taking lines from writers in that book. I think Suvan Kum is actually included in this. You might recognize your line somewhere in here. And uh, our collective has been exploring the color yellow. And of course, yellow has many associations for Asian people, Asian Americans, um, negative and otherwise can be kind of a charged discussion. Um, but we've been exploring the color yellow and its associations with us. So I have this poem that is based on a color swatch that is a shade of yellow, it's called 0945. And um, the name of that color swatch is Treasure Seeker. So I'll start here. I'm gonna read some poems from Instrument. And I haven't, I don't usually read these poems out loud, but they, they have a lot to do with the body and experiences of being um, in this in this particular body. So um, I will read that for, for this reading. Um, Color Swatch 0945, Treasure Seeker. Porridge and urine staining the edges along those old scales of humanity and savagery. Other Asian. Each of the girls wears a number, then circles. This is a scream, not a shout out. We are evidence, evidence of truth, evidence of strength, evidence of the country waxed and contained. You are still my enemy, Asian America. You are my enemy. I am from. Table fruit. I am standing on the bank of a river between supposed two contraries. It is morning, November bright, desert cool. I am wearing a yellow dress, river redreamt into divining line to covet indeterminate architecture of body, brownness, wanted. Yes, I climbed into the tree those fat, dense fan palms imports also to the Chihuahua Hot Springs Valley and held in my left hand, supposed my skins, but I understood my role to allow others sometimes. I am holding distance. I am wearing countries, fevers, and indeterminate people a yellow dress, bananas, a trick of the light or of relationality. I stood in their labiate relief between two. The refugee porn star wears a cat suit. The refugee porn star wears a cat suit complete with cat mask because she, he knows they want and love most, especially on the internet, those little or furry or big eyed ones. In the mirror, I practice having a waist because how will I get back home without one? It should be diminutive enough, that word, to make an average man's forearm look big and or saving them like. And would you prefer me in the yellow dress or the yellow pantsuit? 
or in diphthongs. In truth, I have never really been palimpsestuous. Um, this next poem is, it's, it's based on, or it's about a, a viral video actually, um, which I don't usually write about these things. But um, if you Google the phrase that is in the title of this poem, you'll find the video and it's amusing. And, um, and anyways, this, is, this poem sort of explores some of my, my response to this video. Um, the phrase is Vietnamese brothers balancing on head or in which I question the laudatory retweeting of that Britain's Got Talent video of the young brothers balancing one atop the other's head as perpetuation of model minority myth. Is this a visualization of post-war recovery, doi moi, a circus metaphor or emasculation vindication? Because I know how much Vietnamese men place on being strong, but the Vietnamese body as spectacle, as sight for impossible feats no one ever really needs to perform is nothing new. I would like to ask, when has it ever been necessary for one man to turn upside down another, his own brother, and balance him with no hands, no less, on top of his own head, to walk down and then back up a set of stage steps, backwards no less, clenching face and fists in exertion for the whole world to see. Collectivity, a drug, weight of blood lines us into. Um, and then these next short snippets are from their extractions from the Tale of Q. Q reprise. In this life, destiny shifts without women, leaves, old books. Men's fortunes shift, sick. Women read the world to carry on. Nature, sick. Women read love. The sea now, a last born hope. Um, and I think I'm just going to conclude with one poem from the end of the end of this collection and uh, refers to its title. It's called Instrument. Instrument. I have wanted to be a sieve. I have wanted to be an anechoic chamber and reflect back to you, no sound, but for the quiet rush and thrum of your own nervous blood. I have wanted to be instrument and not just body to be felt the cleavage of the world through, but instead to splay the invisible light weaned out through skin. Skin and rushes, a bird wing desire, a light and under fire. I walked out into the burningest woken of time. Am I acting this enough as light in the interim inner of darkness, now entering the machine in knowing of cloak and insidious of wonder and plunder, not to seek satisfaction in peaks and difficult in climb and into surrenders don't. I walked out into the brilliant woken nest of time and everything was tritest. My response is to sing to the inevitable terror, shake the terrible, terrific air against beating or binding bodies and nation inoculated. My response is to sing into the ineluctable, 
There is a deep, there is a deep. Thank you. Um, I'm going to introduce our next reader, Diana Coy Wynn. Um, a poet and multimedia artist, Diana Coy Wynn is the author of Ghost Of, published by Omnidon, and recipient of a 2021 fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. In addition to winning the 92Y Discovery Poetry Contest, 2019 Kate Tufts Discovery Award and Colorado Book Award, she was also a finalist for the National Book Award and LA Times Book Prize. A Quindeman Fellow, she is core faculty in the Randolph College Low Residency MFA and an assistant professor at the University of Pittsburgh. Thank you, Dow. Um, so grateful to be here um, in this gathering, this shared ethos. And Hua, wow, thank you so much for the tarot reading and just your words, which will carry me through the rest of this week and, and beyond. Um, I feel I've never been in a reading like this one. And so it's, it's very dear to me and I feel a little trembly. You know, there's something about seeing and, and being seen which really alters one's physical state. Um, so I'll just read a few pieces and um, then listen alongside others and, and we'll chat. Um, this first poem, <laughs> I've wrote it like, I don't know, in my MFA like over 10 years ago, back when only the white imagination was encouraged in a workshop space. And I recently went back and made it less white. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Selkie weaning young. Finding her hide, we trailed fingers down then against grains of fur thrusting shoulders into its waxy skin. This is how she found us, the past draped about us like a cloak, hands separating peach halves from a core. Her form in the sound, a pandan leaf peeking through milk. The only seals in Vietnam. American men with green faces. Thinking about Dow's cleavage, not like the cleavage that she mentioned, not her anatomy, of course. So awkward, Diana. Okay, so Dow also mentioned Doi Moi, which is this long sequence that I've been working on actually. Um, I don't lay ownership, of course, to this phase in Vietnam's kind of history of kind of economic um, reform, kind of beginning unofficially in the late 80s. Um, but Doi Moi also means to me as a kind of lay Vietnamese speaker, which is to say I'm not really a Vietnamese speaker, as a kind of like new phase, new time. Um, and this is also where I share that I'm playing hooky for my Vietnamese class today um, because of this reading. But I told my professor and she sends her blessing. Thank you, Kohan. <laughs> At the site where the wound will occur, we know that she was in the garden. The one she had cultivated, seed by seed, shortly after moving in with her husband and their 11 children, all of them together again after years of separation. Her husband's and son's feet in America, her daughters and hers in Vietnam, first in Saigon, then a place unmentioned by the coast, underground in hiding, waiting to make a successful bribe so they might board a vessel, any vessel, collective bride in dark waters facing an unknown stage. Boom, boom, she whispered to my mother. Butterfly, the word my mother used to reference our genitals, two cupped wings like a heartbeat. Boom, boom. In hiding all that year and mentioned by the coast, my mother as a young girl had her first period, its dark liquid unseen in their nest underground. Boom, boom, the smear of red between my thighs, perfectly symmetrical. Two lips pressed together, 
as if to kiss or to strike. When we found small tins tucked in unused drawers and unnoticed parts of the fridge, we fingered the language we would later recognize as his second, the one Ambanoi nudged him toward because he was their eldest and shouldn't the eldest integrate with the whites of that time. When within a month upon arrival, my father and his brother enrolled in engineering courses at Pasadena City College taking shifts as attendants in the school parking lot. As his heavy eyelids lowered on their evening bus ride, shadows of palm trees washing over his face, did he think for a moment that he was back home? In California, the palm provides neither shade nor sustenance. This tree is ornamental, but we know what happens when naplenic and palmitic acids are dropped on it. Burr, I tried to read suspicious of the tin's greasy substance. I did not think to taste it, fearing bitterness, or worse, what if it burned me? Both child and refugee learn the words that surround them as well as words that mean harm. With the palm of his hand, a father may soothe or signal, but what about the palm that holds a child down gently so that a mother may strike. Um, my father used to buy French cookies and French butter, but then hide it in the house from us. And if we found it because we couldn't read it, he would just lie and say that it tasted bad. Um, you know, this is before smartphones and, and Google. <laughs> and I kind of like that my father had this like secret, I don't know, colonial diet <laughs> that he had that kept in the house. Um, okay, I'm just looking at the time here. Okay, uh, okay. I'm gonna read this one, which I actually wrote right after receiving an email from Wa over the winter, last winter. Um, and in it, Wa described seeing a deer being chased to its fate, um, I think outside of a cabin. And I was also in my own cabin in Colorado at the time. So I was just uh, mapping it onto my own landscape. So this one's for you. <laughs> Each of them described the brother's death in different terms, though the fact of his absence interrupted them indiscriminately. Do they know how he found his life? If from inside, it looked like a cage shaped exactly like his body, except two sizes too big, growing as he grew, condensing when he made himself small. And no matter what he did, he couldn't dissolve its borders, not even while he slept. I don't think it let him sleep. At night, fighting sleep, I stay up as if hoping I'll catch wind of something. Tonight, or years ago, a wolf chased a deer past the cabin's front door and out onto lake ice where fate met each discriminately. Borders dissolved, but which one? Between predator and prey or stage and props? Anywhere there is a hole, there are traces of arrival and departure. The wind becomes a palimpsest of the creature no longer here and a song, or is it a cry? emerging from nowhere on its way to nowhere, passes through until the textures of the earth absorb it entirely. Sound, a body's way of making itself known. Silence, a way of knowing. Okay, I'm just gonna end on one more poem. And really the only thing folks need to know is, um, I've also been working in the video archives, home video archives of my family. Um, and been doing this kind of radical empathy project where I recreate my parents' um, honeymoon and, and wedding videos. And, and I'm gonna, my grandmother, my Bawai passed away early this year, pancreatic cancer. Um, and I actually in, in kind of her, the family website, collecting pictures of her, 
I found pictures of her with my grandfather in Hawaii. So I was going to do kind of matrilineal and, and dress up as Hawaii, my Hawaiian Hawaii as well. I mean, because why not? I want to go to Hawaii, right? And just imagine what my, um, what my mother and grandmother did and where they walked and to commune with them and, and kind of um, through studying their movements. Subjunctive. When the tide returns, it paints, it paints over bay mud what evening drains from the sky. What advances spilling over sea grass, smudging pockmarks off the floor? Off the floor of her bunker, my mother lifts her heels so she might see. This is as tall as she'll ever be, and even in hiding, she grows towards light. Though she cannot see them, she knows how clams nudge deeper under cover. One limb slips out from a crack. Slipping into sand is like slipping into shadows where running takes the form of waiting. Many years later, her daughter rewinds the mother's wedding, rewinds and pauses pauses and rewinds, trailing a finger along the wrinkles of the transferred tape. There you are when I find the woman I know in a girl I'll never meet. Rake your hands slowly through the mud until you run into something. The bride lifts her gloved hand to ward off sun. Buddha help us when we go to war. Thank you so much for your time and listening. Um, and it's with great pleasure that I announce and introduce our next reader, Sivankam Tamavangsa. Sivankam Tamavangsa is the author of four poetry books in a short story collection, How to Pronounce Knife, winner of the 2020 Scotiabank Giller Prize and 2021 Trillium Book Award, finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and Pan American Open Book Award, out now with Little Brown in the US, McClelland and Stewart in Canada and Bloomsbury in the UK. Her stories have won an O. Henry Award and have appeared in the New Yorker, Harper's Magazine, the Paris Review, the Atlantic, Granta and Noon, she was born in the Lao refugee camp in Nong Kai, Thailand, and was raised and educated in Toronto. Please welcome Subanka. Um, thank you so much, Diana. Um, I'm so lucky and happy to be here today with everyone. I'm going to read from small poems from um, all four of my poetry books. Water. Water will lie to you, make you believe this unmarked end isn't deep, until you go in without enough air to find your way back. It breaks light before light knows where it is and takes shape uncertain of its own. In the palm of a hand, a glass lifted to drain. If you wait long enough, you can watch it give up its grooves, its scars, keeping warm, cold, losing itself in what it didn't want to become. The snow. The snow tries so hard to be like the rain. It will fall into the same places, an open petal, a trellis stem, a metal fence. It will know the hard pound of cement against its cold chest, what it is like to be left or thrown aside, the path of every gutter, and that everything Everything in this world is against it, even the sun. The heart. The heart, 
The real heart is ugly. Nothing here can break or be broken and nothing can come from here but blood. When you learn to swim, when you learn to swim, it will be different here. You can take a leap off this ledge 10 feet and never touch ground. You can hover in what could be air, lean back further and further, and something that feels like faith will lift, will hold you up. But it isn't faith. It's some kind of physics, law, a rule of matter, put in place, set in place, as old and as constant as that sun, that unsettled speck, that shadowless thing, that thing to have. Mother. My mother had given birth a few months ago. I thought it was odd as she just turned 60 recently. I had not seen her pregnant, but there it was in the room, all formed, a baby boy. I didn't know what his name was, only that she told me I could have him. If I wanted, she didn't really care. And I told her I didn't want him. And when I did, she picked him up. And as she did this, I noticed at the back of his head, a third gray eye. It had opened and blinked and then closed. She took him to another room down the hall and I followed. Then she stumbled and fell, collapsed. I ran to her to pick her up. Her whole face was gone, peeled back, and her eyes weren't even there. I picked her up like she was my own child, and I held her. I was sorry I wasn't there sooner. And all this time, I did not think of that child the one with the third gray eye. I only thought of my mother now, who she had been to me then, and if she would be that again. Pregnant. In Lao, it is to pass. It means to hold a split to hold a splitting, to carry around a split. Whatever you think you are or was split. Not split open and broken away, but the split that is still hinged there, the coming apart that hadn't caught on to anything to break off. To have never carried that split, to not know, what then do you know you have? A sanding down, a knowledge of repair and mechanic, how to keep wood to wood. Theory of writing. We all know two plus two equals four, and we begin with that. We learn to add before we learn how to take away, to lose. It's a great way to learn how to write, to have a formula, a line to follow. Before we know what adding means, we have to know what two means, what two and two means together. There are many ways to get to four. Five subtract one is equal to four. 
1 times 4 is equal to 4. The square root of 16 is 4. A square root is a number that looks exactly like it multiplied by itself. 4 divided by 1 also equals 4. 4 to the power of 1 is equal to 4, too. We can get there through a derivative if that's how you want it. The square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides can also get you to 4. There are many ways to get to 4. Once all these other ways of getting to four are understood, it's not really four you're after. Anyone can get to four, and you know this. Maybe it's the certainty of four, that you can always get to it, that it will always turn out to be the same. Maybe that's what you want, the certainty of four. Or maybe it's the ways in which you know how to get to four that is the point of writing. What you had to learn and build, the time it took to hold, to hold open that possibility for yourself. Um, our next reader is Vicky Now. Cross genre writer from Long Khan, Vietnam. Vicky now is the author of four poetry collections, Human Tetris, Sheep Machine, Umbilical Hospital, The Old Philosopher, and the short stories collection, A Brief Alphabet of Torture, and the novel Fish in Exile. She was the Fall 2019 Fellow at the Black Mountain Institute. I know a little bit of Vicky Now's writing from um, a literary magazine called Noon. Um, in an interview in the New Yorker, Vicky Now, uh, with Diane Williams, Vicky Now is described as being one of the most interesting writers writing in the English language. Thank you for that introduction. Um, and um, I was so engrossed with the reading experience that I forgot that I was also a reader. <laughs> Um, so I guess I, I will read something. Um, and um, Savankam, um, it's also uh, one of, as Diana, um, <clears throat> Diana Wilms described as one of the most interesting um, writers writing today. And so um, I am very fortunate and grateful to be in great company. Um, I am going to read uh, from uh, one piece from the Beget Um In my youth, my father is short and poor. In my youth, my father is short and poor. En route to New York, the boats wear white shrouds as they float down the sea funeral. A sea so rich, it fills the belly of my eyes with liquid ink. From the base of my tongue, an image of my mother lifting me and giving me a wine bath made of dusty strawberries and red swollen grapes. In a hospital bed, white like snow. I'm on the phone with my brother while he asks a, spa, a strawberry to pee. Pee, little strawberry. In the future, the soul will be converted into a credit card in order to make an emotional or intellectual transaction. The soul must slide a card into the slot inside the body under the arm near the bones of the right or left hand. Depending on the wealth of the soul, the card will have unlimited access to a store space of instincts and intuitions and a warehouse of noetic supplies. 
is depicted in Cyber History Month that King Solomon holds the highest credit score, though that data is questionable. Once in a while, an individual is able to purchase another person's memory or hair particle. My body is prehistoric and you are waging war privately with the blow dryer, says the color flower, as it is, as it is being shaken awake by beauty enhancement machines. I hate to drive a porn star home from a bar. I hate it, I hate it. Um, I'm gonna read a poem from About Curve is a Pregnant Straight Line. I feel like I only read one poem from this collection. I feel like it's the only poem that I want to read out loud. And it's kind of sad because this collection took me a decade to arrive in full form. Um, it was done, it was written nine, 10 years ago, but it took 10 years for it to find a home. So publishing is a very abrasively long, long, long journey. And I don't recommend it. So here I am reading you a poem um, for, because there's a high population of Vietnamese readers here. Um, and so, Sapa. I hushed the abnormality of your fingers by tasting the eternal night around their tips. Fentanyl emulates your desire into my broth. I'm clavicle, not vulture, cleaving your seed for pain. I hushed the wildness near your basin-shaped clavicade. You elevate in your throes of ardor, and I bend to meet your feminine furniture, legs, and all as a reference for diptyque and civility. If your tongue is one type of transitive verb, will my lips be able to take yours as a direct object for a complication of time? My left cheek seeks in sequence the grammar of your breath, the transluent material of your fugaciousness. As you lean from syntax into chopstick, if time identifies herself as a pansexual and you agree to be the notes on my laptop, if my desire is binary and yours has urinary tract infection, wouldn't it be cruel if I suggest we all sleep together, muscle and all? on a bed of salt and oysters? Wouldn't it be fun for bivalves to be bisexual? To open a Vietnamese restaurant for lesbians called Sepa? At any rate, um, I'm really happy that Hua invited us all to be together. Um, I always feel like it's a, like a tea ceremony that I'm at attending when there's a high populations of Vietnamese or women writers um, or South, um, Southeast Asian writers all coming together. Um, um, and I feel like that cup of tea is filled to the brim with um, yellow flowers. Um, I am happy to um, introduce Hua who be who um, so generously and kindly in, uh, invited us all for this um, tarot, card, tarot card reading, tea ceremony, poetry reading, um, and I will um, introduce um, her um, by reading the introduction that I wrote um, for the LA Review when I first interview her. Um, um, uh, sometime earlier this summer. 
Before my exposure to Vietnamese poets such as Daos from Diana Coy Nguyen and Stacey Chun, Hoang Nguyen, who lives in Canada, was the first Vietnamese experimental poet that I read here in the States. And the first poet period, I was living in South Bend and couch surfing at a stranger's home while whose small library had written chapbook from Ugly Duckling Press, tells of the crackling. Of course, anytime I saw Nguyen on a book, I immediately read it. Needless, needless to say, I was in thaw with Hua's unapologetic expression of beauty and her short lines that break like haiku, communing with the poet Ho Seng Hung from the Lei Dynasty. Um, so please welcome Hang Wing. Thank you so much, V. Um, what terrific readings from Viki Nao, Suvankam Tamavangsa, Diana Koi Wen, and Dao Strum. Thank you so much um, all for joining us. I will read some poems and then I'll, I'll uh, share the tarot um, expression to close us out and in celebration. I'll be reading a short set of poems that I selected from A Thousand Times You Lose Your Treasure, the book that came out this year and um, that for the occasion for which B and I spoke and one of the most um, um, novel ways of, of uh, conducting an interview is we met, met in a Google doc and, and basically V's first question was a sort of a variation of what kind of flower would you be because my name means flower, which was a great way to, to begin. There aren't flowers in this one. There's some dark pink feathers though. This poem's called Naming Assembles You. She learnt flags, pennants, and ah you, not me, slow sad dance to city street. And I packed the jealous book, oh yeah, under the highway that is the understair tailor as a mistress seamster copying pants out of Victoria's Secrets. Bell, you called me Bell, captive and able, her cups fancy leaning with umbrellas and dark pink feathers. It's true, I won't laugh again like that, silky. This book does take on diasporic themes. It also takes on biography of my mother's life when she performed um, aerial type circus tricks in a, in a daredevil feats inside of a wooden structure they called the barrel or the wall of death. Um, it also touches on other points in her biography, um, including um, several kinds of uh, ghosts that are um, both real and imagined um, in this poem, the ghost of uh, the first Hua, it would have been her daughter that she gave my name to before um, I was born, but that daughter had died. We run on trash grass and of course, lose phone numbers, photo of the first Hua, burial site locations, silk lining to sleep in, ground cinnamon and trees, coffee. Lose the word lose in its original shape. You lose every other word as in most words now, glossy gold looks cheap, the color of loss, jock stick and paper, smoky bundled trick and encompassed spirit mirrored emblem, mirrored emblem, ghost money. I am soot-faced as the feminized male god, massive delta silt water, black Madonna, mother god, born of thy destruction, the running blue shock of her. Uh, this is a narrative poem that describes how my mother met a fate when she was 12. Her name, uh, her Vietnamese name was Diop. The flying motorist artist, 
at 12, Diep didn't have a half cent entrance fee to see the circus performance. When she was 12, three motorcycle performers traveled from Thailand to Kanta. I thought they were from the Philippines. No, Thailand, a motorcycle act that came to her province in the lower Mekong Delta, joining a country fair for the new year, 1954. Everywhere we came to see displays of snakes, contortionists, fortune tellers to exchange caged birds. She, the disobey, Diep done with farm chores, washing clothes, seeing to chickens, but never the kitchen. She made things burn or break, they said, spilled rice in the dirt, bad luck, they said, and banned her. Recall that one seer and her mad possession, spirits in the belly, suddenly enlarged, round and hard. When she saw the palm reader, they made tell of a sailboat. Come see the flying motorist artist, riding shadows on the wall of death, riding shadows on the wall of death, watch them defy death on the wall of death, danger perpendicular, their reaching hands, two men and a lone woman riding her name, loud and loud and loud motorbike flying, the wooden wall roars. Less than slash three. I feared I would lose it, taking a running leap at the song, the design half horse fly, half dragonfly, Vietnamese valor rising up of an other world journey I took, reclined on a couch on horse bridle trail. Yes, radiant string, speak for me. I become a voice elemental, lame foot herb, knowing healer I met. He, the local feared mage seer, it was a quest for understanding. We both laughed when I quoted Rilke in English equating beauty with terror the way my mother was not impressed when I sang my rendition of It's the Hard Knock, Life for Us. Mud Matrix. Drown versus flood, silken mud, burned burrowing creature with strong rodent teeth, Mekong moon story, right water on water, right country, float on flat boats, river moon reflective and her voice there. She is shrugged now, high collar quality TV channel brassy. What electric ribbon of water we becomes delta fish and moving mouths as the nine dragons move more. Grateful bastard, the passport proud amoeba thim comes with knees and scratchy pleas of refugee, ching a cartoon plunder, chong a gangplank gratitude. We the expected happy, thankful, pleasing, thankful, pleasing one, broken jade bracelet. Mother gone to mud, how to hook her and stop her flying hair can eat a tooth or other crumbles, bird beak tooth. No, it's flies in your eyes. Crow pheasant. You can wave off the gnat or join it in the next life, live two hours or three days or 800 years like an 800 year old banyan tree, beat the drums of spring for the near me new moon. I kick the wicker dog, kick it hard to explain the ancient joke, how to be vast and slow compassion. The strange girl you named high up in the pond sky, but you didn't know how to spell reckon very well. You misspelled reckon and hooked me into a graffiti of surrender. Grow old bones to eat pain. Fuck off renewal candle and burn the metaphor. Despite 
no cl claims of no birds in Vietnam because of our constant eating aggression. Who wants to hear about your Asian North American experience and a way if I write flowery and incomplete? We bird you to the sky and suffering released there. We cry city mountains. I came to tame with a song bowl, a song swap to dynamite the arthritic as an expansion trick, a true jade vibration travels as it sounds, sending a vibration up the face, pyramid shaped. She was born in a halo. Delta mouth begins the sentence, coop, 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 call of pheasant bird. This is the last poem. Spoken through the cracked eye. Drink from the stars, womb woven song, silt sift, silt gift, slit mouth spilled out and grain pours out to be free and alive, arms out like wings on either side. You'll stab each other like needles, said her grandfather with his star charts and too many books for a farmer. But what about the aborted babies? Of course their souls fly and help us and counsel, can cauterize memory, but what happens when luck happens, her solo memento, that photo, an island delta root nest, a dragon tongue drum and leatherette clasp purse. In the future, even stones will meet each other. Thank you so much again for attending. Um, as promised, I'd like to um, summon a sort of a regathering of our energies into the space. I, I did pull some cards um, while Dao was reading because um, in the beginning, because Dao had actually was the person who responded to my request for a question for the Tarot. And that question is about how do we summon call collectively um, as gathered diasporic uh, women of Southeast, with a Southeast Asian roots as writers to inhabit and manifest. And in other words, how might we contribute to blooming this space? So I put the question in the chat, how might we contribute to blooming this space? And what's really interesting, so I'm gonna, I went ahead and used um, Bobby Abate's Outsider Tarot um, that I mentioned earlier to pull three cards and the first card, I got two threes actually, interestingly, after this, that conversation about twos earlier, the three of lights, um, which I love, of course, that it's a circus performer. The acrobat um, is the outsider that's associated with the three of lights. Um, those of you that are familiar with the tarot would know it as three of wands, the sun and Aries. And then the second one is another fiery card, which is the six of wands here in the outsider um, tarot um, depicted with these um, glowing orbs in a tree um, with one lion faced lantern being hoisted um, because of course it's Jupiter in Leo and it's a very expansive celebratory card. Both of those cards I think of as um, ways in which we can put collective artistic um, vision into practice, into visibility um, that has a kind of thrill-seeking um, fierceness. Um, and then the final card I drew from the Outsider Tarot deck was the Three of Bottles, which is one of the first cards I drew actually from when I got this deck. And um, and it actually is a reference to Tarot. It's um, Rachel Pollock, who I think in A Thousand Times You Lose Your Treasure and Eden Gray are depicted um, drawing cards in community here, more of a private conversation. So it's an interesting tension between private and public, but it's definitely um, one that talks about a blooming space. And one of the central figures is um, 
a sumac droop, which is the fruit of a staghorn sumac. And I, um, inspired by the deck, actually created a little um, sumac droop lantern with um, three yellow flowers at the base, recalling those um, yellow flowers in the teacup that V had mentioned earlier, which are calendula flowers from um, a ceremony that I had performed that was in response to um, a kind of a meditation on continuance, um, thinking about our ancestors um, and gratitude. I want to thank you all for coming here um, and also invite any of my um, co-conspirators if they'd like to say hello or add anything to um, our meditations. I'm just so grateful to be gathered together. So um, I'm altering the security settings so that anyone in the Zoom can sort of turn on your microphones if you would like to jump into the space or answer the question about the being. Just want to say thank you, Hua, for for bringing the circle together. And three seems like a um, like the three of cups. I think of as a collaboration card, also. So it makes a lot of sense. Thank you to everyone for reading and sharing your words. And thank you, Rail, for hosting us. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Dal. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Suvantan. Thank you, V, and of course, Wa, uh, for bringing us all together so beautifully. Uh, this has been really a beautiful space and experiment in, uh, as you said, poetic conspiracy in unruly but open spaces. Um, I wanted to highlight something Diana said very early on that really struck us, I think. Uh, that there is something about seeing and being seen that really alters your physical state. And I think that hit the nail on the head. We've all been in this beautiful atmosphere and affect of feeling that you've created. Uh, usually here, we welcome our artistic director, Fang H. Bui, for a few closing words. Unfortunately, he's uh, in between a few meetings at the moment, but he uh, texted ahead that he listened in on as much as he could. Uh, and he sends his love and courage to you all and says that he's very eager to listen to it first thing in the morning as he makes his meditation portraits. Um, so that's uh, from him, but from us, thank you so much. As always, we'll share the recording of today's reading on our YouTube archives. So it will be available in a day or two if ever you'd like to revisit this magical space. Um, and we do this every day here at The Rail. So please join us again tomorrow. Um, at 1 p.m. Eastern for a conversation on Donald Judd's essay, Una Stanza per Panza, which is featured as a special edition in our October issue. We'll be joined by law professor Amy Adler, art historian and attorney Virginia Rutledge, and rail editor at large, Joan Key, and we'll close with a poetry reading by Sarah Ghazal Ali. That will be at 1 p.m. Eastern right here in the Zoom. Other than that, thank you all so much. Uh, I invite you now to turn on your microphones if you haven't already and say hello to each other or goodbye on your way out um, or anything that you feel compelled. But thank you all so much. This has really been so, so special. Thank you so much, everyone. This has been amazing. Thank you. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Diana. Thank you for missing thank you so much. Class. Thank you. Pleasure, Hi, Robert. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Hoa. Thank you, Diana. Thanks, Dal. Thank you for that reading. That was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Oh. oh. Hi. Hi. A... Thank you so much. It was beautiful. Thanks, oh. Norma. Thanks for joining. It was fantastic. Well, wow. so good to see you. Um, this was so moving. All these words will stick with me. And thank you for using the deck. I'm so, so moved and inspired. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Bobby, for your beautiful deck. <laughs> Is this your deck? Yes. Did you, wait, where are you?
Oh, I'm I'm somewhere. <laughs> You're somewhere I'm, here. Somewhere oh, in it. I'm under right. a tarot, but thank you. Oh you wow, do. beautiful deck. Thank you so much. All right. Well, have a beautiful afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. Love and courage.